First Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 1, reading through verse 10. This is the word of the living God. It was given, and it is given for your good. So let's give attention to it this morning. First Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pause and ask for his help. As we consider just verses 8 through 10 of the second chapter together uh, this morning, let's pray. Father, as we now turn our attention to the life-giving word, we turn our attention to this which is important for your church, and we pray that you would help us by your spirit. We know that you have promised him to us, and we ask indeed for him now that he would open our eyes, he would open our ears, he would govern everything that is said and everything that is heard, for the glory of his name, but also for the good of your church, we ask and pray for Christ's sake. Amen. I think it goes without saying, as we, uh, we look around the world today and the culture in which we are living, that there is a great deal of confusion in that world we live. The culture wants to flatten the distinctions between men and women to the point where it obliterates the unique and important roles of both. Of both. Now look, the problem is not unique just to the world, although we tend to blame them for most of it. That problem has crept into the church. It has found its way into the church, and it is indeed a serious problem. It is a serious problem because when wrongly understood and applied, it threatens the very fabric of the church. You see, if the church is to function properly, especially in the areas of worship and prayer, everyone, that is to say the men of the church and the women of the church, must know their role. They must know their God-given calling. And they must not fight against those things. They must not bristle against them. Instead, they must be content with he who is all wise and all knowing, who has made you either a woman or a man. It wasn't an accident. It didn't just show up that way. No, no, God intentionally did that and placed you in a local church that you might function according to that gender assigned Reality that the Father in heaven gave you. Contrary to the culture out there who thinks there's no difference, God says differently. And indeed there is. And if the church is to function correctly, we must know what that is. And Paul begins here in these verses to separate, to distinguish, to to make that distinction that the church would be healthy as a result. You see, it's important, isn't it? It's important to know these things, that we might be a healthy, flourishing church, indeed a church that desires to see the very blessing of God. You see, for each of you this morning, I'm about to say something very profound. 
God created each of you. Some of you he created male. Some of you he created female. Now when I said it's profound, I wasn't serious. It comes from the very opening pages of the Bible. There in Genesis 1, and where God created them male and female after his own image. God did this. You are made that way. Every one of you then therefore hold the distinction above the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. You are unique. You bear the image of your creator. And as such, because of that imago Dei, the image of God in you, you are afforded then therefore basic rights, basic privileges of respect and dignity and a host of other things. But that does not mean that within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, or even in your homes or other places in the world, that they're all the same. That God has assigned to us, to you ladies, and to me as a man, and to you men, various roles, especially in the life of the church, that need to be faithfully performed and, 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 and exercised if the church is to, to flourish. You see, you're equal but diverse. Man, you have roles to perform in the church. Ladies, so do you. The question is, do you live it from the hearts, and are you doing so with a spirit of gladness? Or maybe you're discontent with the role the Lord has called you to. I can't even begin to tell you the number of churches that I'm aware of that have have fallen into liberal thinking because of the fact that they are not content with how the God of heaven united and and fit together a people, male and female, within the life of the church. If providence is to be a faithful beacon in a culture that is seriously confused on this point and that culture that has infected the very church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must know what we are to do in the life of the church, especially in matters of worship. In the context here is that which has begun already as Paul is giving instructions to a young pastor. I've said this many times, and you're going to hear that many more times uh, through the life of this study in 1 Timothy. He is teaching his young minister, son, child of the faith, how the church should operate. And he begins now talking about the roles and the distinctions and the differences, frankly, between men and women and how they are to live and serve in the church. He begins in a very general way in these verses, verses 8 through 10, and as we're going to see next week, not next week, the week after next, Lord willing, how it even gets more specific when it comes to the teaching roles of the church, and then it even gets more specific than that when it gets into the eldership of the church and the diaconate of the church, and there's different roles. And each of us have been assigned those things. And so this morning, with God's help, I want to show you Paul's instructions to the men and ladies of the church in the areas of worship and prayer. This is what he's talking about. It's very succinct. He summarizes very quickly, verses 8 through 10, these subjects. I'm going to show you the instructions that Paul gives here to you men And to you ladies of the church, in the areas of prayer, in the areas of worship. Two points as we consider this, and I hasten to say the points so that I can then say after that, the first point is aimed at the men, and the second point is aimed at the ladies, and that means ladies, you don't get to check out while I'm talking to the men, and then Men, you don't get to check out when I'm talking to the ladies. I don't know how else to outline these verses other than the way it's obviously there. Two points. First, Paul's instructions to the men of the church. You find that in verse 8. And Don't read into this. And then we find in the second point, Paul's instructions to the women of the church in verses 9 through 10. Now, don't read into that. Don't think, oh, well, he took two verses to talk to the ladies, only one to the men. And that must mean something. It doesn't. The verses weren't there. The numbers weren't there when he wrote it, okay? So don't get all nervous about that. The numbers don't exist in the original. 
All right? He's beginning an argument about the roles and how to fulfill those roles in the life of the church. He begins with the men, and then he turns his attention to the women of the church, really, in verse 9, but he continues that same emphasis all the way through uh, verse 15. Let's first consider Paul's instructions to the men. Ladies, you're not to go to sleep. No twiddling on your phones. No doodling. You need to listen. Why? Well, some of you are young ladies in the church. Some of you are unmarried young ladies in the church. And I'm going to show you, at least in part, what kind of man you ought to be looking for. It's right here, at least in part. So pay attention. Paul's instructions to the men of the church, we find it there in verse 8. The target, of course, as Paul tells us there in verse 8, I desire then that in every place the men should pray. He identifies who he's talking to. The term that Paul is using here is not generic. You cannot rightly substitute, I desire that in every place that humanity or mankind should pray. That is not what he says. If you wrote that very phrase in your Word document or in Grammarly or some other modern frou-frou weird device, they're going to try to change that word, men, into humanity or humankind or mankind. Because that's the world we live in. No distinctions, right? Wrong. Paul is making a distinction here. The term in the Greek is specific for husband or man. That is to say the male of the species. There is no ambiguity whatsoever. He does that, that he might then establish the contrast and then continue to establish that contrast when he deals with the ladies of the church or the women. Again, not a generic term, but one that is specifically aimed at the male of the species. The instructions, what are those instructions? Well, it's pretty simple, isn't it? Do you know how to read? You can see Paul desires that the men should publicly pray. And the identification of the location of these prayers is essential to a right interpretation of the instructions. Paul is not saying that only men can pray regardless of the place. Did you hear what I just said? He is not arguing that only men can pray at prayer meeting. He he is not arguing that only men can pray in their homes and the ladies can't pray at all. That's not what he's saying. He is specifically giving instructions when it comes to the order of the church and especially in the confines of what we're doing right now. And that is in the public display or the public effort and labor of worship. This is how it has been historically interpreted as you peruse throughout the centuries of in decades of, of biblical studies as to what Paul means here when he says that I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. The context is such of public worship, and that is exactly how I am taking it. And so the location of these public prayers is the corporate gathering of God's people, the public worship service. It is here that we begin to see the Holy Spirit's design for worship and how the church of the Lord Jesus Christ should be run and led. Now, I think you know that when it comes to worship, we pray. I'm afraid to ask how many prayers of the church are offered in worship in this congregation. So let me just review or remind you in case you have forgotten. There is the prayer of invocation, which begins our worship service after the call to worship. There is the prayer of confession of sin that follows it. Then there is, of course, the prayer of thanksgiving. And then there is the pastoral prayer or the prayer of supplication. But there's another one. There's actually two more, three more prayers. There's the prayer of illumination that we, we, we do right before the preaching of the Word of God. Then there's the prayer at the end of the sermon, the, what some have called the prayer of application, 
And then, and then there's two more. There's the two prayers that accompany the Lord's table. Now, I say all that. I remind you of all of that, not to bore you, but to impress upon you that this church takes the subject of prayer quite seriously. How could anyone say different? When a vast, when a great amount of energy is, 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 is spent appealing uh, to the God of heaven in prayer. But what you notice, and you should notice, that when it comes to worship, as we pray, and when we pray, only the men are praying. It's not sexist. It's counterculture. Uh, put a different way, it's just biblical. And I take it here that when Paul talks about these men lifting holy hands, he has in mind those men that he's going to eventually describe in more detail in chapter 3, the men that are ordained to that work, that task, that role within the life of the church. That is why... You don't see women up here praying before the congregation leading. You might be able to pray better than some of the men. And I, frankly, I've heard some ladies' prayers much better than some of the men's prayers that I've heard in my life. But that's not the point, nor is it relevant. Paul says, I demand, I desire, I want, I wish to see in the churches and every place, every church and every worship service, men praying, men leading God's people. Now, does not mean they're better? Let's be real clear about this. I am not better because I'm standing up here preaching. I am not better because I pray a lot in the worship service. Our elders are not better because they do those things. That is what God has given them to do. That is their role. And if the church is to function correctly, they must do those things. There are denominations that are moving congregations to include women in worship in such a way that they do these very things that I've just said should not be done. And frankly, Paul has said they shouldn't be done. It's a world we live in. Paul says, no, this is to given to men. It is our practice here at Providence. I don't expect that's going to change. And it means that public prayer especially should hold a special importance to the life of the church and especially in worship. Paul begins with prayer. He's already really started with prayer all the way back in verse 1. Now, what is his exhortation to these men? If the men are the ones to lead the people of God in prayer, then they ought to do so with the right attitude, and right heart and mind as they do. They ought to do it with the right attitude, the right heart and mind as they stand before the people of God and pray. This is not the place for casualness. This is not the place for flippant behavior or exercise. It is a serious thing. It's a serious thing for a man, and and that is all he is, is a man, sinner indeed, to stand before the people of God and plead with the sovereign God of of heaven and earth for the sake of God's people to stand and do that work. It's serious business. This isn't just a conversation that has been uh, being uh, had by the men in the church, the ordained men in the church, with some buddy on the street corner. No, no, they stand up here and they plead with the God of heaven for your soul and for your good and for his glory and for a host of other things. It's serious business. And Paul gets to the reasons why it's so serious, but he indicates it even uh, states it when he talks about how they ought to be doing it, lifting holy hands before God. You mean you just can't come up here and live any way you want, do anything you want, and then stand before God's people and pray any way you want? No, unless you want to die. 
which is always the possibility. There were these two guys in the Old Testament. They thought it was okay. This is serious business. It's serious because first the men are called, the men are called to pray. The men are called to pray. The men are called to lead God's people. And that's why we do pray. We're told to pray and worship. And in our case, we pray many times throughout worship. Short prayers. Long prayers. By the way, where's your head? Mind? When, whether it's me or somebody else praying the pastoral prayer, and you know, like I've heard other people pray pastoral prayers in this pulpit, I, they're most usually much shorter than me. I understand why. They don't know you like I do. No, I mean that. I mean, they don't know your needs. They don't know what you're wrestling with. They don't know the struggles that you're experiencing. I'm your pastor. They're not. They don't know. I do. You might think, well, you pray too long in the pastoral prayer. I've actually heard that complaint in this congregation. Seriously? I don't know. Really? We pray too much? Where else? What else should we be doing in this room other than reading the Word of God and singing His praises and hearing the preaching? I mean, what else is, what's so, what else is more important than prayer? What are you doing when I'm praying? Ladies, I know I'm talking to the men right now, mostly the men who, what are you doing? Thinking about what? Lunch? How hot it is in the room? I wish they'd turn up the air conditioning. I mean, there's a host of things you might be thinking. I hope you're focused on the prayers of whoever it is, whatever man is standing here leading you to the throne of grace. Men are called to pray. Men are called to pray lifting their hands. Now, be careful here. Paul is not prescribing a posture. He's describing one, but he's not prescribing one. We know the difference, right? The difference between description and prescription. He is not saying it must happen. That every time I pray from this pulpit, I must lift my hands. Now, you might notice, maybe you've never noticed because your eyes are closed. I don't know. But in the prayer of invocation, I do raise my hands this way. And then when I pronounce the benediction, if you notice, my palms turn over this way. It's all symbolic. But Paul is not here describing a prescriptive way of doing it. But he is describing one way. He says they should lift their hands. This posture is mentioned by Paul, and the Word of God mentions but does not prescribe many different postures in prayer. But I think the point really is that posture matters. We might have heard that phrase in a different way growing up. Uh, body language matters. Now, you don't have to say a word to somebody to know how you, what you're thinking. I can look at you and I can tell you what you're thinking without you saying a word. I raised three teenagers. Trust me, I'm pretty good at reading body language. Those of you who are parents, you know exactly what I mean. Posture matters. It's communicating. It's communicating something. Good, bad, or indifferent. It's communicating. But here, Paul wants us to understand that this posture of lifting hands, lifting holy hands, is designed to convey an outward expression. And this outward expression, the inward reality that Paul will address in a moment. And while it is true that body language communicates much, we must be careful to understand that it doesn't say everything. The posture then, therefore, must equal the attitude. It must equal the attitude of the man praying. Now, let me give you just a brief list. This is for those of you who like to take notes or are curious. Six ways in which posture and prayer is referenced in the Bible. I've got a bunch of references here. I'm not going to bother to give them to you. If you want them for me later, I can give them to you then. 
First, the posture of standing. We do that in our worship service, right? The prayer of invocation, you're standing, right? I know you're thankful. You, I don't have you stand during the pastoral prayer because there might be a lot of people you know, falling out. Don't lock your knees and that won't happen. This is what I was told in the military. Standing is a posture. Hands spread out or lifted heavenward. The one that Paul mentions here, bowing the head. That's the one that we are most, accom- uh, most uh, acquainted with, aren't we? Bow our heads and close our eyes because when you close your eyes, it's more holy when you're praying if your eyes are closed than when they're not. Hogwash. That's a tradition. We close our eyes so we're not distracted. Believe it or not, there are times up here when I'm praying that my eyes are wide open. Maybe you've noticed. Maybe you haven't. But I'm looking down at this desk when I'm doing it. So I might not get distracted. Sometimes the Bible references the lifting heavenward of the eyes in Psalm 25 and verse 15. Looking up to heaven in prayer. It's a posture. It's communicating. Where's my help come from? My help comes from the name of the Lord. I'm looking up. Why? Because that's where he is? No, but that's how we think of it. Kneeling. When's the last time you've knelt in prayer? Beside your bed or wherever. In some contexts, in some worship contexts, you go into some old churches and you'll find in the pews with we know as kneeling benches. You know, they fold up and they fold down, and during the worship service, the people of God would kneel at the kneeling bench as the pastor would lead them in prayer. We could do that here. Just turn around and pray, you know, with the chair in front of you. Kneeling. Finally, falling down with the face on the ground. I doubt we do that very often. And if you're going to do that, I wouldn't recommend you do it in the middle of a public park or the store because you might find yourself rushed off to the hospital by some overzealous bystander. But all of these postures are given in Scripture. They're given to communicate what? The, at least it should be communicating the inward reality of the one praying. And here, the inward reality that Paul wants us to see is that men are called to pray with holy hands. Men are called to pray. Men are called to pray lifting their hands. Men are called to pray with hands lifted that are holy. Now, what does Paul have in mind here? Is he literal? Holy hands, wrinkled hands, marred hands. I don't know about the holy thing. Is that, is, is that what, what he has in view? The idea that he has and he's communicating is that though the hands are raised as an expression of holiness, the heart must equal the outward act. You can raise your hands to God in prayer all day long. If your heart is far from him, it doesn't matter, men, those who may be seeking the office of, uh, of elder, You can stand up here and fake God's people out all you want. And you might even be successful in doing that, but you're not going to fake out God. Paul says, if you're going to stand and lead my people, if you're going to stand and lead God's people, and you're going to raise your hands to heaven, they better be holy hands. They better be clean hands. They better emanate from a clean heart that is acceptable uh, to him. The idea is drawn from the Old Testament temple tabernacle practice. One commentator puts it this way when he references this idea of holy hands. He says the reference to holy hands refers to temple worship in the Old Testament. God's people consecrated themselves by washing their hands before prayer. Cleanliness was really, in this case, next to godliness. You've heard that phrase, right? Okay, well, now you have. When Paul mentions the outward sign of holy hands, he is talking about the inward reality of a holy life. Men called 
to lead the people of God are called then therefore to be holy. McShane, Robert Murray McShane, that young Scottish minister, he said the most important quality of his ministry was not that he preached well, and though he did, it was not that he did other things well, but that his people would see what? A holy minister. If you want to stand, men, and lead God's people in prayer and worship, you better have holy hands that reflect a holy heart. To stand before God and speak on behalf of God's people to the God of heaven, to the God of heaven in prayer with the outward show, but bankward in, bankrupt inwardly is frankly an abomination. The Lord sees it. The Lord sees it. He knows the condition of your heart. Boy, it's humbling, isn't it? Ladies, you might be thinking, I'm glad I don't have to do that. Well, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be living a holy life. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have a holy heart or any other stuff. It's a pretty big responsibility to stand before God's people and pray on behalf of God's people, and to ensure that it's being done from a frame and attitude of holiness above all else. Fourth, not only is it the men that are called to pray, the men are to pray with hands lifted, the men are to pray with hands that are holy, reflecting a holy heart, the men are called to pray without anger, or quarreling. You might think this is so strange. Why would he toss this in here? I mean, why these two things? Well, it was a problem in the Ephesian church. First and foremost, remember Timothy, he's pastoring the church at Ephesus. That's what he's doing. And Paul's writing to him, and it's an occasioned document. There were things that provoked Paul to write this letter to Timothy, and this is one of them. That there was dissension and there was faction. It was a particular problem in the Ephesian church. There was anger and there was quarreling. There was dissension in the ranks. Constant friction that was running through the church. The man who lead the people of God were causing these problems. They need to purify themselves from these sins and indeed others if they are to rightly stand before the people of God and pray on their behalf. One commentator, he summarizes it this way when he says the sins of anger and argument have particular relevance for men. <laughs> now, you might think, well, I know some ladies who are pretty argumentative. and, and Okay, fine, maybe. But generally speaking, men are more given to these things. To quibble and fight and, and posture over matters of doctrine and They've got to be right. And who cares who they annihilate on the way as long as they're right at the end? Because men are competitive by nature. Yeah, yes, some ladies are, but men generally are more competitive. Okay? Paul says, no, this is not what you're going to do. You're not leading Christ's church with this attitude of anger and fighting and quarreling and all this other business. Uh, you men are to lead the church, but you're going to do it in a holy way with a holy methodology, not with critical nature and competitiveness, as ones who tend to argue first and listen later, ones who would rather be right than reconciled, men who get angry when they don't get their way. Look, if men are leading God's people this way in prayer and in worship, you know what that's doing? If that's their attitude, if that's their heart, if that's the condition of their soul, you know what that's doing? It's hindering the prayers of God's people. It's not helping. It's hindering the prayers of the saints that they're charged to lead. Well, so much for the men. <laughs> I'm glad to get off that point as fast as possible. Okay, that was a joke. It's a big responsibility. Paul says, hey, men, if the church is to lead, be led well, if it's to run well, this should characterize you. 
Well, what about the ladies? Now, I wander in where angels fear to tread, but that's what the verses are here. I can't avoid them. And so I'm going to deal with them, and I hope I don't offend anyone or step on anybody's toes, but I'm probably going to. And, well, I just say that up front as a disclaimer. Just as in verse 8, Paul has in mind a specific group of people here. It's not generic as it was in verse 8, and now in verse 9, he's, he's looking at the ladies of the church. Not just humanity, mankind, no, the ladies, the female of the species. To you ladies in this room, just as the men called on to lead worship have instructions governing their behavior, you too have them when it comes to gathering in worship on the Lord's Day. Now, let me clarify something real quick. I stuck this in my notes when I was writing this section because I was, well, I think I was afraid. Um, I probably was a little. The things Paul states here are mostly reserved for the ladies of the church, but this does not mean that the men are immune to immodest behavior, though generally that is regarded for uh, the ladies. Men can be immodest, especially in our culture that we live in today. I've seen it. Each of us should heed the point. The pursuit of godliness is more important than any of the trappings of the externals. It is more important that we put, well, it is more important, that is to say, godliness is more important than what we put on our bodies, which is really the point Paul is making to you ladies. He's making it to men too but he's especially making it to you ladies. Paul is not telling the ladies of the church here in these verses to dress like slobs or to not care what they look like when they gather for church on Sunday. He's not saying that the ladies of Providence next Sunday should come in here with sackcloth and ashes on their head and dress like, you know, frumpy. That's not what he's saying. He's saying there's a problem at Ephesus. There's an out-of-balance problem at Ephesus. The ladies of the church care more about what they look like than they do about their own heart. In other words, their soul is irrelevant to the problem. The problem is their soul, but the ladies, haven't, they haven't got that because they look good with their earrings and their braided hair and their costly attire and everything else that they put on. That's the problem. You know, it happens in the 21st century. Paul wants the focus of the ladies in the church to be of godliness. Just like he would want it for anybody in the church. Godliness that flows out of a heart that is right with the God of heaven. A beauty that emanates from there will be visible for all to see regardless of what you're wearing necessarily. That's Paul's point. He is not saying, you ladies who have earrings on right now are in sin and need to repent. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying for you in the room, and I've got my glasses off so I can't see, if you have braided hair, he's not saying you're in sin and you need to repent. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the problem oftentimes for ladies is they get so enamored with their appearance they forget their heart. They forget the godliness that ought to flow from within. That inward beauty that cannot be dressed up with earrings and braided hair and costly attire. It just can't. That's his point. Now with that said, let me give you his specific instructions. The location of this instruction is exactly the same as it was to the men. This way, that's how we know we're, we're dealing with the gathering of the people of God. We're dealing with them as they come together on worship in the Lord's Day, when they come into this room. Paul begins these two verses with the term aligning the location when he says, likewise also. When you come to worship, but not only worship, ladies, do you spend as much time as, 
fixing your hair, worrying about your makeup than you do with your heart. As you do with your heart. Are you concerned about the condition of your soul? Men are to be holy as they lead God's people. You are to be godly. You are to be holy. You are to be godly. Are you concerned about your heart, your soul? Do you put as much effort into that aspect as you come in this place as you do about the earrings you have on or the hair that has been braided? Now, the context that Paul makes this statement, well, was frankly going to shock some of you, probably. <laughs> I know it did me, a little anyway. We're talking about Ephesus, right? We're talking about a city that was ensnared under the goddess Artemis, remember? It was a few sermons ago I mentioned this. The goddess of love and all this sexual promiscuity infidelity, unfaithfulness. And in Ephesus, one of the markers of those that were unfaithful was the way they dressed, their appearance. It was one of the indicators. It was a stereotype, grant you, but it was there nonetheless. Paul is thinking of this when he pens these words. He is saying to you ladies, you are, you are not wedded to a pagan deity. You are wedded, as it were, to the God of heaven, to the true God. And while appearance, again, is not something that he says doesn't matter, he is saying what mostly matters is your heart. What is most essential to the life of the church is your godliness your faithfulness to the true king. That's why he says he wants the ladies of the church to dress with chastity and modesty. He's contrasting the pagan culture of the world with that emblematic of one who professes faith in Christ. There should be a difference. In Ephesus, there was no difference. People were coming to worship looking very much like the temple prostitutes of Artemis' day. And that was the problem. He says, no, ladies, you are different. And you should look different than the world. Now, I know in the 21st century, that's not a very popular thing to say. I could tell you story after story of my parents in Bible school in which they were required dress codes and all this other stuff. That's all fine and great. But here's the thing. If your heart is far from the Lord, it really doesn't matter what you wear. Paul wants you to deal with your heart. Godliness. When that is right, when that is flowing in the right direction, it will affect everything else. The way you dress, the way you talk, the way you act, the, your behavior, all of it. Now that's true for men as much as it is for women. Now, some specific instructions that he gives. Three of them, in fact, positive traits that stand in sharp contrast to the merely outward appearances that the first century church at Ephesus was ensnared with, and frankly, many ladies in the church in the 21st century are as well. Three things he says. First, he wants them to be respectable. Notice what he says in verse 9. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. Respectability. The term itself, as given here by Paul, is only used twice in the New Testament. It makes it difficult, of course, to render you know, an accurate biblical definition of the term. But it's interesting that it's the exact same term that Paul applies to the men in chapter 3 and verse 2 when he says an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, there it is, respectable. It is, in a, in a sense, a form of humility. 
which is really the attitude of prayer. Even as one commentator states it, he says, a Christian woman does not go to worship to meet men. That's not why you're here, ladies. You young ladies, you single ladies, that's not why you're here. It may happen. The Lord may do that for you in his providence. That is not why you came today. You don't get prepared for worship at home because you never know, I might meet a man. No, you get dressed for worship, ladies and men, because you're about to meet with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's why you're here. And how can someone not respect that? You young men looking for a wife, that's the kind of wife you want who's com concerned with how she comes in before the God of heaven. Because if she is concerned about that, she's going to love you the way she's supposed to. Respectable. Modest. Oh, boy. Modesty. This term used by Paul, <laughs> I get to say it, <laughs> It's a hapox legomenon. It's only used once in the entire New Testament, and it's right here. Makes it hard, doesn't it, for a Bible student and an exegete to really unpack the idea of the term. Many of you know I raised two girls. One of them was, was far more thoughtful than the other. I don't mean that as a disparaging remark. The oldest was more like me, and, you know, she just charged in. That was the way she was, and she got it from her father. But my middle child, much more thoughtful, contemplative, careful, you know, skittish at times. Drove her dad crazy. We were out talking one day, and she just said, and by the way, I have very attractive daughters, but I'm biased, you know. She said, Dad, what, what does it mean to be modest? Dads, how would you answer the question? Because I know I just sat there like an idiot, didn't know what to say. I mean, I had some ideas running around in my head, but it was just all very messy. It's hard to come up with a definition of modesty that I can nail to a wall and give to you that you can live by. I can't say this, though. The way you dress, ladies, causes men to look at your body and not your face. You're probably not being modest. Now, I say that also to say, men, you have a responsibility to keep your eyes in the boat and look where you're supposed to look. You can't blame the ladies in the church because you can't keep your eyes in the right places. That's your problem. It's not theirs. Ladies, you have a responsibility to help your brothers out. If what you put on causes men to look in the wrong places, maybe it's a modest problem. Maybe not. I don't know. You see how hard it is? Bring attention to your face. The term used here describes a woman who is chaste and honorable. It implies that a woman should not dress in a seductive or suggestive manner. Now, that's what the term means. It extends itself even to demeanor or the way a woman even carries herself. The, connotate, the connotation of the term is one of feminine reserve in matters of sex. It's not the culture we live in. Modesty? It doesn't exist. A casual perusing of news programs will tell you that. There is none. Paul's desire for the ladies of the church is that they are respectable. They are modest in their behavior and in their dress. Now, how do you evaluate that? Well, I'm going to tell you how. 
and I'm now wandering into more of an opinion thing than I am declarative thing, but this may help. For those of you who are married in the room, if you ladies aren't sure, ask your husband, do you think this is okay? Does this come off as modest? If your husband says no, probably should do something. Heed their insight. Remember, they're not women, they're men. Just like they're not a woman. Listen to what they say. You don't always, you're not always going to agree, but heed it. Paul's desire is that the ladies of the church are respectable, they're modest, and they are women of self control. It's prudence, temperance, discretion, soundness of judgment. It means to be sober and to exercise self-mastery. It is the same word that Paul comes back to at the end of the chapter in verse 15 when he says, yet she will be saved through childbearing. They continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. So men, what kind of young lady do you want to marry? One who's respectable? One who's modest? One who exercises self-control? Isn't causing chaos in the midst of the church and a host of other things? That's what you're looking for. What is Paul's point in summary? Well, Calvin is helpful here. I'm just, sorry, I was just thinking about a conversation my wife and I had this morning, but I won't say it. Uh, it was an egregious sin, though, I just got to tell you. It's just awful. She wrote in one of my books about Calvin. There, I said it. Okay, it's a joke. I don't really care. But I threatened to say it when I got to this point. So there, I said it. But Calvin has a point here. A summary statement to you ladies that may help you. He says the faults that Paul is identifying at Ephesus and many 21st century churches. The fault is excessive concern and eagerness about dress. Paul's wish is that their dressing, the way they dress, should be regulated by modesty and moderation. For luxury, luxury and extravagance comes from a desire to make a display, which can spring from vanity or wantonness. Paul attacks by name certain kinds of immoderation, such as curled hair, jewelry, and golden rings. Not that jewels of gold are completely forbidden, but whenever there is a shining display of them, they tend to bring with them all evils which spring from self-concern or unchastity. Now, if you don't agree with Calvin, you take it up with him. He's dead, so you have to wait till glory. But I think he's right. As in the issue with the men, the issue is the same with the women. It's a heart issue. It's a godliness issue. That the beauty of a woman flows from inside to out. That's what makes them beautiful. And that's what Paul wants the ladies of the church to understand. The issue itself is indeed the heart. Is it, it is not merely about an outward show, but, does it, but it is about whether that outward appearance matches what is inward and what should be an inward reality. Thus, Paul's desire is that the ladies of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ be concerned more about living godly lives full of good works and service to the king of the church. That should be your first desire. Now, how many times you looked in the mirror this morning? You know, men, they get out of bed in the morning, get out of bed in the morning and whip the comb through their hair, slurp down their coffee, and they're in the car and they're gone. It takes about seven minutes. 
I've been married 36 years. I can assure you it takes more than seven minutes. This, that, and the other thing has to happen before you can ever get out of the house. Paul says, look, be more concerned about your godly living in the church. Not unconcerned about the way you look, but be more concerned with how you live your life. That's what he says there at the very end of this section. Both what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Presumably there are ladies in the church at Ephesus that were professing faith but weren't demonstrating it or living it. Your behavior in the church is going to look different than mine. Why? I'm an ordained minister. It's going to look different than the elders of the church, the deacons in the church. Why? Because they're ordained to those roles. But that doesn't mean your role and your function in this church is less important. It's vitally important. If the church is to function correctly and well. In both cases, men or women, the issue is the heart. It is there that all the issues of life spring. I read that somewhere. Like in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, when Solomon, the wisest man in the world, didn't know his act very wise, the wisest man in the world said that it's from the heart that all the issues of life spring. Does your outward appearance and behavior mirror what is in your heart? Is your heart seeking to be attractive by faithfully following Christ and what He has commanded? Which one is it? For a man seeking a bride, the most attractive thing to him ought to be that she is faithfully serving her Lord. And it's from there the beauty shows up. Men, you don't give a whit about your heart. You can stand up in this pulpit all day long and pray, pray with your hands lifted heavenward. I'll give you a ladder if it'll help and get you closer to heaven. It won't matter if your heart is wrong. You elders in the church who have that privilege, indeed it is a privilege, it's not a right, to stand up here and pray before God's people and lead them in worship. How's your heart? How's your family life? If you can't do this in a way that represents the holy nature of the office, then you ought not. You should quit. Serious business. But at the end of the day, it's a hard issue for both. It won't matter how many times you pray before others. It won't matter what clothes you put on your back. If your desire is to glorify Christ, you will be attractive and you will be one who rightly models the faithful church member or leader, one who is bent on serving Christ from the inside out. But if that's not you, then it won't matter at the end of the day. It'll all perish. Additionally, each of you have roles to perform in the church. Each of you are important, men and ladies. So fulfill those roles. God has given them to you. How do I know that? Because I look across this room and I see men and I see women. And I know women, ladies, what God has called you to do. Men, I know what he's called you to do. And the confusion only comes when you get confused and you start doing what you're not called to do. And so, ladies, you won't be elders in this church. You're not going to be deacons either. And you know what? You should be glad about that. And I don't mean that in a joking way. I mean that seriously. Because then you'd be outside of the God-given role. And you can't be happy there. Men, you can't be the ladies in the church. Our culture teaches different, doesn't it? God says something entirely opposite of our culture. So fulfill those God-given roles. We're going to see more of them as we plunge further into this letter. But fulfill them. Always keep in front of you the importance of who you are as a lady of the church or a man of the church. You're important to God and His church. And the fabric of the church depends on you fulfilling those roles to His glory.
Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word and as difficult as these subjects are at times, we trust that your spirit will guide us in these things. We pray that you would help us, that you would cause us to live according to that which you have made us to be, that the men of the church would pray and labor and faithfully lead your church with holiness in mind always, without anger, quarreling and fighting and infighting. And the ladies of the church would emulate true beauty that springs from the godliness of heart. May you grant that to this church. And to this congregation we ask for Christ's sake.